Welcome to Season 8, Episode 35 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Sunday, the 1st of November, and we're at Old Camp in Liverpool. We're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and the community. I'm Alan, and with me in person is Martin. Hello. Mark. Hello. And Laura. Hello. This is a bit weird, isn't this it? Is really strange. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time Martin's done an in-person recording. It is. Yeah, I'm bound to get it wrong. It's been a long time since we've done one. Yeah. Yes. It's and weird really doing weird. it completely differently in a different place, in yes. a different part of the different country. Different equipment. You'll probably notice we sound quite a bit different to normal. Uh, that's because we've got a different audio setup. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's still going to be good. And we're all a bit worse for wear because we've had a weekend's worth of Og Camp. Um, which we're going to be talking about a bit later on, possibly in next week's show. <laughs> <laughs> right, should we get on with it then? Let's. Let's. And now it's time for some news. Uh, so there's an official WhatsApp app now available on Firefox OS. You can get it from the Firefox OS marketplace um, Mm. because Mozilla's apparently reached an agreement with WhatsApp. Ooh, what kind of agreement? Uh, An agreement that there will be a WhatsApp client on Firefox OS. The kind of agreement that there hasn't yet been for Ubuntu. Uh, Or up until now there hasn't been for Firefox either. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, at the moment they say that if anyone tries to implement a WhatsApp... Who's they? At WhatsApp have said, haven't they, if anyone tries to implement a client Mm. for... Ubuntu, then they're going to be very unhappy. And I don't know that they've publicly said that. Oh, I thought they had. No, I think it's no. any third party. Yeah, yeah okay. it's in oh, general. In general, <laughs> right. And so <laughs> now they, experience, they have it? blessed a, a Firefox OS as a platform. So it looks like they're using a um, Android runtime thing called Open Mobile that allows you to run Android apps on Firefox OS. So actually, that's probably the more interesting, bigger piece of That the is very interesting. Because mm-hmm. it means that Firefox OS could run potentially hundreds or thousands of different Android wow. apps. Do you know if is is this um, something which would be baked into Firefox OS, or is this a wrapper that the app uses? Um, I don't know. I don't know technically how it works. Um, there's um, some details on the Open Mobile website. It's called um, ACL Application Compatibility Layer. Right. And they say on their their website it enables Android apps to run on non Android systems. Uh, ACL for Firefox OS is coming soon. Right. Just, ACL. Uh, that it sounds like. Is. Well, I know it sounds like the same acronym for what Tizen uses. Ah, that could be. Uh, it could be. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if uh, it is on Tizen, but yeah, they mm. they certainly do have Android. Apps. Now, you, you've said before that you think that if Ubuntu was to use something to run Android apps, you'd be shooting yourself in the foot because you don't think that that's a way of creating your own. Uh, OS like app, app ecosystem. I so, th- do you think this is a bad move? I think it's a double-edged sword because yeah. you. But it, it's different for Firefox OS because for Firefox OS, the the platform is the web. Yeah. Right. And that's always still going to be there, mm. and people will still carry on making web apps. Mm. Will they still be carry on making web apps and put them in the Firefox OS marketplace? Is the question. Right. Um, you know, or will they just say, "Well, we don't need to bother because there's there's the Android version. We'll just use that." So yeah. th- this is your escape clause. You, you don't you don't have to worry about making a, a Firefox OS version or yeah, insert name of any other minor mobile platform. Yeah, you don't have to bother because the Android version may well work on on them mm. with this ACL thing. But then the, yeah, the flip side is for platforms like Sailfish, like Ubuntu, like. Tizen, will people can will people make native apps for that platform if they know they don't have to bother mm-hmm. and therefore the the ecosystem for that platform can't necessarily thrive yeah. but also is dependent upon Google yeah. and Android still being there and and this compatibility thing that needs to be updated whenever new versions of yeah, Android yeah, like, and, and, yeah. and APIs change yeah. and so on so it's it's a real double edged sword and I'm, I'm I'm not completely certain that it's either a good idea or a bad idea because there are benefits on both sides. Right. That's the way I feel anyway. Next in the news, the European Parliament has passed a resolution for European member states to drop any criminal charges against Edward Snowden, grant him protection and and consequently prevent extradition or rendition by third parties in recognition of his status as a whistleblower and international human rights defender. 
This is a big deal. This is a really big deal. And Mm. I I had no idea they were planning on doing this. It just suddenly came out of the blue. Yeah. And it was by four votes. Yeah. What, four votes difference? Four votes difference, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 285 to 281. That's interesting. Yes. So, so what practically speaking, I mean, that's, you know, having an agreement, but practically speaking, does that mean, you know, potentially one country could say, let's let Snowden in, and then he gets on a plane from Russia yeah. to that whatever country, and he has a happy life in Europe? Yes. Or not necessarily gets on a plane because Europe borders with Russia. So he could just walk across the border. Across the border. Across the border. border. Mm. Well, depending upon which country we, we, is, yeah, 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 yeah. is invited to yes. reside in. But yeah, that sounds like that could potentially be the case. But does this mean that any European country can issue that invitation? Well, uh-huh. they're not allowed to extradite him anywhere. Yeah, but so yeah, extradition, yeah. but extradition, like you've got extraordinary rendition where people yeah, are taken out that's... of a country in secret to another country where yeah. the law doesn't apply, yeah. or that law doesn't apply. So, you know, take them away to... Yeah. I don't know America's new friend Cuba and uh, or wherever mm. and that makes this law a bit of a joke you yeah. know if if they if they did that but is he so high profile you know yeah. you probably wouldn't hear about it if it was some random spy or yeah. you know yeah. um Yes, now he's got a Twitter account. Everyone would notice if he suddenly disappeared off the internet. <laughs> well, I'm sure they'd write a bot to just keep on... You'll never know. You'll never guess what yeah. I found out. Oh, it wasn't as big as you, you, you thought it might be. I'm just going to stop tweeting now because I've got nothing interesting left to say. Bye, everyone. <laughs> but he did actually tweet in response to this. He just said, oh, it, it seems like the rumours are true. This is amazing. Yeah. He, I think he said it was uh, game-changing. Did, did they say who proposed the, the vault? Somebody um, surely must have done it. Somebody must, yeah, must have. Yeah. No, I have no idea. Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't know that detail. I didn't notice that. Well, hmm. there's some links in the show notes. Maybe a yes. listener can do do some research and answer that question for us. <laughs> <laughs> What's next, Martin? Uh, next up, Theresa May says that the contentious parts of the web surve- uh, web surveillance. Surve- oh dear, web surveillance plan. I know, I know. It's fatigue. It's fatigue. Um, <laughs> and this means that uh, they're going to be um, not giving powers to go through people's browsing history and won't be requiring communication service providers uh, from the UK to store third party uh, data. For those of you listeners who don't know, Theresa May is the UK's Home Secretary. So yeah. she's in charge of deciding what intelligence uh, services are allowed to do, mm. part, uh, among other things. Mm. So she was talking about things like. Uh, if someone goes missing, being able to look at their phone records in order to see, like, last phone calls they yes. made or received. Um, but then moving on from that, what, you know, whether they used WhatsApp and who they contacted yes. on WhatsApp so that maybe, you know, if the person they were talking to was a kidnapper or something, they could go <laughs> and you know, find that person and yeah. have a route to try and get the person back. So it was, she, she was talking kind of at a high level about metadata, like getting yes. metadata about who, you, but not necessarily about the content and the yeah. fact that you still need to have warrants to, to go and get the actual data. So, the, yes. but I, it's still somewhat worrying to yes. me that, that she, She's in favour of, you know, reaching in and, and grabbing yeah. that metadata anyway. And it it still strikes me every time that there's a statement about this in response to uh, in response to concerns about them like wanting to ban encryption or whatever is their response always seems to be a long line of no, we don't want to ban encryption. We just want the effects of having banned encryption. Yes. <laughs> right. So they just want to sit in the middle while of your encrypted traffic mm. and see. What it is, yes. without breaking encryption, yes. But they want to be able to see what the data is that's encrypted, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Okay. <laughs> oh, so they want to man in the middle the encryption. Is that the idea? Well, it. Yeah, that, well, it practically, it's, that it's, seems the yeah, only way. It seems to do from it. what they from what they've described, that seems to be what they want to do. But they they keep on saying, "No, we we understand encryption is important. We don't want to break or ban encryption." Mm-hmm. We just need to be able to right. do this in extreme circumstances. Okay. But yes, we'll see how it pans out. I mean, the the laws to to um, to put this in place haven't actually been finalised yet, so we don't really know what they're saying that they want to do. Mm. Moving on, uh, the EFF have posted about a victory for users. 
Uh, the Librarian of Congress renews and expands protections on fair use. What's this about, Mark? Well, this is something I wasn't aware of. So the, the DMCA has... Uh, DMCA? The, the, right, the Digital, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, which, uh, among other things, says that um, if something has uh, digital rights management, even if you are legally allowed to use the content which is protected, you are not allowed to break the digital rights management on that content. So this could mean that, for example, if you've got a DRM protected uh, ebook and the text of that ebook is out of copyright, even though you are legally allowed to use that text, you wouldn't be allowed to break the DRM on that ebook in, able to get, in order to get access to that text. Now, there are exceptions to these rules, um, but in order to get an exception to the rule, there's a, a three year process whereby you have to you have to basically put forward the exceptions you think there should be and they can be argued and counter-argued um, and they will be granted or not. And then you have to do it again. After three years, they expire and you have to do it again. Wow. So this this process has just happened after a three-year process and the EFF have been lobbying for various things which should be legal to do. And among those this time, which is which are now legal to do, you are now allowed to break the DRM on car software so that you can analyse what's going on. This is obviously very yeah. relevant. But some of the other things um, that were argued for at the same time as this was extending the, the right to break um, DRM on DVDs and Blu-rays, specifically to allow people to remix the video um, that's stored on them. Right. Because remixing the video, if it wasn't DRM encrypted, is okay under um, fair yeah. use. But if, but if technically it's technically impossible, but because technically impossible, or technically because, difficult, and yes. you have to circumvent yeah. the DRM in order to do it. Yes. And they're saying that now you can do that, or this yes. is the start of the no, conversation. No, no, that is, that is, that is, um, that is an exception which is like currently valid for the next three years and may be renewed after three years. And this is US law. US law, yeah. Hmm. But if you remix copyrighted material, you yes. still can't publish it because of copyright infringement. You uh, can in the US. You know, they've got the right to parody. Right. Oh, fair enough. Okay. Good news, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Yes, I mean, they, they, they tout this as a victory, but they don't like this process. They think that the fact that you've got to do this every three years is appalling, basically. Because right. if they did, if, if they weren't there to do it, then after three years, then all of these rights would go unless other people were there mm. actively pursuing these rights. It's a bizarre process. It is, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Moving on. GNU Herd uh, 0.7, GNU Mac 1.6, and GNU MIG 1.6 have been released. Are these more recursive acronyms. Oh no! What, what, what is GNU Herd? <laughs> it's it's a it's a kernel. No, it's a micro kernel. Oh, micro kernel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. Okay, it's software <laughs> <laughs> which which runs on a computing device. I'm just checking. Yeah, 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 I'm not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it runs, but it, it's uh, free software, and it's like an alternative to Linux in the same way Linux is an alternative to Windows, Windows and OS ten, yeah. yeah. kind of. Well, it's it's a specifically an alternative to Linux it's, in that it's a kernel. It would replace what it's a micro Linux, kernel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would replace what the Linux kernel yeah. does in a Unix-like system. So you would still have the GNU userland stuff on top of Herd, right? But instead of having Linux underneath, you would have it would be GNU slash Herd. Yeah. Why? Well, actually, wasn't Herd started in 1991? Yes. So a little bit before Linux. But it never really got the traction that Linux did, partly because it's hard making the kernel microkernel architected <laughs> in the way that, that they've done. Right. Um, and, and it didn't get mind share, whereas Linux did. Mm. Um, and some argue this is why uh, Richard Stallman is bitter and twisted about it because Linux, you know, took off and GNU didn't, uh, GNU Herd didn't. But, um, it, it doesn't seem to even, I mean, this is a new release and there are some, you know, some worthy changes in there, but it doesn't seem like there's really a super active community around herd. Like, I mean, obviously. An active community, not a sizable community. Yeah. I mean, well, active in the, if you look at the git commits, there's yeah. a few git commits between, like, there was a bunch in September and October and then some in June and a few more in May. It's not like, a relentless stream, which yeah. if you looked at the Linux kernel, is a relentless stream of patches coming yeah. from lots of different places. Mm. And, and I don't know if there's com 
commercial people behind herd or who want to push herd. It doesn't no. feel like it. Why, why is it needed? Um, well, it was needed back then because yeah. there wasn't a free software kernel yeah, yeah. like like Linux is. Yeah. But you know, Linux came a couple of years later and then just took off, yeah. and herd has been kind of been left in the dust. But some people still believe that technically herd could be excellent and a great alternative and you know secure and fast and all the things some, you want from a kernel. Some time ago, I was really interested in seeing herd succeed because I think it's got a better architecture, but too much water has passed over the years. bridge now. Yeah, more than and, twenty years. Yeah, and you know, Linux and BSDs are established, mature. Um, herd is interesting, but I, I think too much time has gone by now, and it's not mature enough in the time that's elapsed. So you said you like the architecture. You said it could be. That's the theory. Good yeah. at stuff, but. Well, just that nobody uses it, and <laughs> it's, it's hard to prove that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, on paper, it should be good, yeah. but uh, or great. Yeah. But it's it's hard to prove that when you know there's so few people working on it, and you know. But mm. we will see. Moving on, uh, I think that's all the news we've got time for this week. Unless you we no okay okay uh, do you, well now go on squeeze it in okay we'll squeeze it in. Uh, Twitch playing Pokemon was easy mode. Today, Twitch viewers have been invited to do something altogether more challenging. Install Arch Linux. Uh-huh. Using the same Twitch chat-driven concept as the collaborative Pokemon playthrough, anyone will be able to enter commands and control the installation process. I have no idea what you were just talking about. So Twitch is uh, is often used for gamers to broadcast what they're playing for other people to watch. Oh, it's so there's so there's, well, no, that's Twitch. Twitch no. allows you to broadcast your game. Mm. And there's a chat box at the side where people can, like, chat to you while you're playing the game. Now, there are, um, or <laughs> people have written bots that listen to commands given in the, the chat right. and inject commands into the game. So people played Pokemon and the people in the chat were voting. So people were saying, press A, press A, press A, press A. And then the bot would go, okay, there's consensus, I should press A. So it presses A in the game. Right? Okay, because Pokemon's not like time critical or anything. Right. Um, but it, I mean, it could be, but it, yeah, it, it's not. And it, and it could be used to play all kinds of games. But what they're doing now is they've got a machine that is blank and has an ISO image and they boot it and people inject commands and key presses into that machine via consensus in the chat. And uh, watching it right now, it seems to be stuck at a boot screen where it's trying to boot from the hard drive. So they've actually got it to the point, I think, uh, where, you know, they've got partway through the, the install process. But the thing is, people can vote for bad things. Like so subvert the process. Yeah. So there are lots of people <laughs> saying during the installer, press, press down, press down, press down, press down. And then there's consensus and then press enter and they press enter on the power off option or something. And then <laughs> or game select, over. Yeah. Or select some obscure language that very few people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that would, you'd be good at this. Yeah. <laughs> we were watching them. We were watching them trying to partition the hard disk and they, they managed to several times. They managed to type F disk slash dev slash SDA. And then it would open F disk for them to do the partitioning. And then people would say, control C, control C, control C. And it would X it. Yeah. And they then have to type it in again or <laughs> try and up. press up and enter. Yeah. yeah, it's quite hilarious to watch. Like you know, you you kind of wish them, will them on. Yeah. Come on, come on, you can do it, you can do it. And then you know, consensus is press Control C, and it's <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> jolly good fun. It's um, yeah, it's 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 entertaining to watch <laughs> if you like that kind of thing. Well, as an Arch Linux to you, it's nice to see that people are learning how to install Arch Linux the right way, <laughs> 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 even if they're trying to beat beat uh, beat each other's. Uh, prevent each other from actually succeeding. And that's the end of the news. And now it's time for some community news and events. So, by the time you're listening to this, UOS uh, 1511 will have happened. What's UOS? <laughs> <laughs> we ask this every time. Yeah. Ubuntu Online Summit. It's the virtual meeting place where there's loads of sessions done over Hangouts and IRC where people discuss stuff around Ubuntu and there's a show and tell uh, 
uh, track. So it's not it's not just like boring like meetings about things you know mm-hmm. planning. There's there's people turning up and demoing stuff. And, and you'll go for a beer together. Oh no, you can't. No. So do you know <laughs> what is going to will have happened this URS? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the, the schedule, it's all on the website. If you go to summit.hobuntu.com, uh, you get redirected. Uh, and it's on, it was on, will was be on over three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, Mark Shuttleworth usually does an opening keynote and sets the tone and maybe makes some bold statements <laughs> of the, um, that, you know, what we're going to do over the, over a while. Um, and then there's round tables, there's, uh, sessions about Snappy, sessions about developing apps. There's like tutorial sessions of how to develop your first app. Um, planning sessions for some of the some of the apps that are on the phone and in the um, uh, on the desktop. Uh, some server stuff. There's some uh, convergence related things. So, but the 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 nice thing is that they are all done over Hangouts. So. They're recorded and they go onto YouTube and you can go back and watch right. them later. So although they run all day, yeah. you don't have to, I have to be the right time so. all the time. Yeah. You can pick the ones you like. And, and if uh, multiple tracks run at the same time, so if you miss one because you're what, you know, participating in something else, yeah. you can go back and watch it after the fact. Mm. Cool. Yeah, it's good fun. Excellent. And uh, that's uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Um, also, uh, a blog post has just been posted by Sturmflut, who's one of the contributors to Ubuntu uh, Phone. Yes. And uh, he's one of the insiders, and he's posted a bit about the convergence stuff on the Nexus 4 Ooh. and how to get it working and what you need to attach and some troubleshooting stuff. And, Ooh. Yeah. Convergence as in the full Docker phone and it. Yeah, so he's, he, he's, um, he's taken loads of photos. It's quite good because he's got loads of photos so you can actually see it in action. Um, and it. Tells you how to how to set it all up. But it's basically, you know, in essence, a Nexus Four plugged into a slim port adapter, plugged into a display with a keyboard and mouse. That's it. And, cool. Yeah, you know, it shows how it works. And he's uh, he's got a few more posts planned um, about uh, uh, more in depth topics relating to convergence on that device. If only I'd gone to old camp and seen somebody from Canonical demonstrating this in person. Well, this is exactly <laughs> it, it's super it's super well timed because yeah, at old camp, yeah, we did demo it, and uh, it's nice that other people can see the same yeah. kind of thing, yeah, uh, and play with it themselves. And also, I guess can use these notes to go to their own meetups and local events and reproduce this. Yes, that's a great idea, actually. Yeah, if you you know take it along to your Linux user group or yeah. whatever, like hack free space. software, Hackspace, that kind of stuff. Yeah, take along a Nexus 4 and a display and show it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great idea. And there's uh, one event uh, which uh, was blogged about by David Planella from the community team at Canonical. Uh-huh. And it's uh, an UbuCon Summit happening next year, 21st to the 22nd of January in California, Pasadena. And it's hosted at scale, the uh, Southern uh-huh. California uh, yeah, Linux, Linux, Expo. Linux Expo. That's the, <laughs> I can never remember that last bit. Um, yeah, it's hosted at scale. Right. So there will be loads of people already there for yeah. scale and the UbuCon's happening there. So there'll be loads of sessions. And, so uh, is this like an old UDS? Kind of, it's kind of invoking the kind of spirit of the old UDS. Right. But UDS is a different animal to the Ubicon because UDS was very much about, you know, planning yeah. and, and, you know, getting consensus about getting stuff done for the, the following cycle. Whereas Ubicons have got a more user and developer focus. So you okay. know, users can come along and learn about stuff. They yeah. Need, like Bit tracks. Conference-y. And, yeah, it's more conferency and workshops and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, I'm going uh, and a whole load of other people are going as well. So it'd be good. I've never been to scale before, so I'm really looking forward to going yeah. to scale mm. and going to an Ubuntu, a real in-person Ubuntu event. Yes. Uh, it's going to be good fun. Cool. 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 And I think that's all of the community news and events. We love getting your feedback, so please send it to us. Even the pointlessly mean stuff makes us laugh a little bit. If it's short, tweet us on at Ubuntu Podcast. If it's less short, but please no essays, email us on show at ubuntupodcast.org. Or you can leave a comment on the relevant show notes on our website, ubuntupodcast.org. 
that's it for episode 35 uh, we'll be back next week when we'll be discussing Old Camp Ooh, yes uh, ring, uh, reading your feedback and recovering I think. <laughs> <laughs> so yes we'll see you all next week bye bye, bye. bye.